I am Lucy Edwards, Director of Client Success at PhD Studios, and I'm here today at Compass in New York City with my guest, Lance Pendleton, and Lance is the head of uh, agent, agent strategy, strategy and, and success. success. That's right. It's a yes. mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> I am the National Head of Agent Strategy and Success. It's a real pleasure to be here with you. I'm actually excited for this because you and I have known each other for a while now. We've gone back for what? Five years? Six, no, seven years now? Six, seven years yeah? at least. Yeah. Jeez, time flies, man. COVID <laughs> eliminated two full years of my memory. So if something is four years, it's actually six because I don't remember anymore. I agree with you. As a matter of fact, I think going forward, everything will be before COVID and after COVID. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I would love to talk about so many... Uh, different uh, directions that agents should be taking. So we're going to have a long and fun conversation. But let's start with your story. How did you get involved in real estate? Um, well, so my story in real estate is actually uh, purely accidental, like all great love stories are. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, I started off as a kid. My father was an independent real estate consultant. He worked with uh, families that had made their money in other industries and discovered that they wanted to then move into real estate development, um, particularly within the Caribbean. So oh. he worked for the Pritzker family and currently most recently with Carlos Pellas in Mexico and uh, the development of uh, Punta Cana and a bunch of different resorts um, throughout the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. um, but as a child growing up, I was always fascinated by the real estate aspect of these sort of luxury second homes and things like that and how people got involved and the sales professionals that were involved in it. And I just, I found the whole thing fascinating, but I watched him as a consultant um, and I was deeply moved by his, his skill and tact at being a relationship driven person that was thoughtful and that was a real mediator amongst people that had a lot on the line, mm -hmm. both from a learning standpoint, both from a financial standpoint. And so that was sort of the first time that I thought, you know, as every young kid, mm -hmm. I will never be that. I don't want to do that. Nobody wants to, you know, no kid wants to grow up and like do what their dad does. You mm -hmm. always want to do all kinds of other things. And over the years, I progressively kind of slowly realized that that was the path in which and an audience in which I felt most comfortable working in and around and with. So, But you didn't jump into real estate right away, right after college. And you no. started in a completely different field. You were part of Apple and uh, what and, did you do yeah. there? Yeah, so I was, a, um, I was a specialist on the sales floor for Apple uh -huh. um, and I'd worked my way into being a market trainer as part of a program that they had there. And you know, in there I started teaching Apple's orientation to new Apple employees. Um, and a lot of that was built on the Ritz-Carlton learning model, which was fantastic. And so that was a journey in which I learned mostly in that time, how to help people navigate this experience of being a salesperson in something still coming from a relationship driven mindset. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, and it was really an amazing experience. It deeply influenced as you and I kind of chatted about mm -hmm. before, it really deeply influenced the work that I do today. Um, and, and in particular, ironically, I always say, you know, I help people who love technology at that time, explain and teach technology to people who do not care about technology. So I kind of think that's my biggest driver currently in working okay. with agents in the world of technology. But um, it is, uh, it's, it's been a fantastic run and a fabulous ride. And I just sort of from there moved my way in and about through different experience as director of learning through a real estate brokerage, um, and then into a chief innovation officer for one of the largest Sotheby's realty affiliates in the U S and eventually here at compass. Well, that kind of throws me into another question. Um, relationship, you talk about relationship and real estate is is the, the base of it, the foundation is relationship business. Mm -hmm. And the agents count on it, but they need to go through some changes. Things are so different now and again, before COVID, after COVID, and God knows what's going to happen in another few years. And they don't like to change. They're already used to building their relationship by sending postcards or by uh, uh, getting some magnets for a refrigerator. That is their relationship building. And what you are preaching and what you are proposing is a completely different um, direction. And it's not as easy as some agents would like it to be. Absolutely. Um, so I'll preface it by saying that my philosophical belief and approach into things is completely untraditional technically because I work oftentimes to the opposite end. So, you know, my background's in behavioral psychology and, and the science of well being. And what I look at and what I've studied over the years, and I'm deeply self-taught, so let's be very clear, I don't have a PhD in anything, so I wanna you know, put that caveat out there. But I, I've been incredibly blessed to learn from other people 
um, and then sort of pay that forward through the different learnings that I've been able to accumulate um, in my time. Um, and as I, as I love to say, one of my favorite sayings is, all wisdom is plagiarism, only stupidity is original. So <laughs> I, I've learned over the years that the key here is when we talk about it being a relationship business, most of the actions that an agent takes do more to damage their brand and the relationship than actually improves and deepens the quality of the relationship, right? So if you think about it, okay. you're involved, the real estate agent is involved in the third most stressful time in a human being's life, right? Right behind death and job loss. You're involved in the third most stressful time in a person's life with the largest financial transaction most people will ever make. Mm -hmm. You're then involved for a long period of time. So after you begin to develop the trust, you engage in that trust, right? You're in that like mind share with them and you've built this. Mm -hmm. For months on end now, you're riding all the emotionality, their highs, their lows, their financial questions, concerns, and problems, their marital concerns and problems, their kids' lives, their kids' concerns and problems. You ride the emotional roller coaster with folks, right? All of this, you bring them to fruition, you bring them to the promised land, right? And at the very end, after you've done all of this for them, what do you do? You put them on a mailing list. <laughs> and in your CRM. <laughs> there is literally nothing that says, I hate you more than putting someone on a mailing list. But we believe that that is actually what produces and maintains a relationship because they've been taught that it's wrong. That's not the way that you build and maintain healthy relationships, right? There's 2.8 million agents in the world. In the world. Point Technically, I'll backtrack. There's 2.8 million licensed real estate agents in the US. If you look at that though, most recently, about close to 90% of all transactions are only done by 10% of those licensed agents in the US. That's correct, yeah. Think about that. What other industry has 90% of its population not actively producing anything. But what are those 90% doing? My open house, my just sold, my new listing, the hot new color to paint your front door in spring, my newsletter, my newsletter. By the way, you haven't opened the last five things I've sent you, but hey, <laughs> my newsletter, right? So how do the 10% that are actively engaged and involved in their business then compete by doing the exact same thing from a relationship standpoint that everyone else is doing? You don't. But yet, what do we train to and what do we teach? Marketing, marketing, marketing. Look at a brokerage. How does a brokerage win agents? How does a brokerage satisfy that? Well, look at the offering that we say, come to us and we're going to give you, right? What is it? Marketing. Marketing. Some more marketing. Your brand, your image, the sign, the logo, the stuff, right? No one says here, when you come to us, what we're going to do is we're going to help you understand functionally and behaviorally how you can deepen the relationships and create something that is uniquely special because most agents, only 10% of their business all year comes from outside third-party sources, like disconnected source. 90% of an agent, of a good agent's business mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. comes from people you know or people those people know. And yet what are we doing? This massive push to see how can we go an inch deep and a mile wide to reach as many people as possible, but where's all the money coming from? right? Yeah. An inch wide and a mile deep. And yet the training, the education, the support, everything involved in the industry revolves around what? Stuff for the sake of stuff. What can we pump out? What can we do? So in a relationship mindset, and a lot of what I teach and a lot of what I, what I try and help people work through is understanding the behaviors behind these things. Because it's easy to push a button, e-blast 4,000 people and feel good really quickly, right? Like I did something, I connected mm -hmm. to people. It's hard to pick up a phone to somebody that you haven't spoken to in six months and be superhuman and go, hey, just wanted to see how you're doing without thinking I feel salesy, it feels weird, like all that emotional stuff that comes up in that process, that's hard. And that's not something that people do easily. So you actually have to work with someone to understand behaviorally, what's the blocker, where's that engagement? So you talk about the blockers to agents mm -hmm. these days. Yes. It's all interpersonal. It's an emotional thing. It's very, very much emotionally driven. Well, traditional coaching, and um, I enjoyed traditional coaching, and it actually helped me, helped me to focus, helped me not to be just spread around so thin that I achieve nothing at the end of the day. So traditional coaching is teaching exactly what you are not supporting right now. Let's send a lot of emails. Uh, let's have 200 postcards sent at least once a month to your past clients. Let's get those magnets and just distribute them in your whole neighborhood and so on. 
your approach is completely different. You do not really, not that you're against it, but you don't really support traditional coaching because you feel that it's just a Band-Aid. It's not yeah. really a cure for someone. Yeah, so I, I wanna be very careful in how I word this for you because it's <laughs> not that I don't support traditional coaching. Right. I believe there's a better way. Better way, yes. I believe that there's a better way that supports longer term growth for somebody and longer term success because the best thing about being a real estate agent, and sometimes the worst thing, I think, is that your personal life and your business life are deeply intertwined. That is true. You, right. you don't have any weekends, right? Right. And But also from the aspect of like your business comes from, right, the people that you know, people those people know. Many times those are people that you know in your community, in your neighborhoods, your, you know, your neighbors themselves. It's a very intermixed world. And yet what's interesting is I always look at it from this perspective of I look for similarities in the world, right? That's how I interpret and understand mm -hmm. things. And when I started studying why does traditional coaching fail or why does it not really create longer term growth, the most consistent model that exists is traditional real estate coaching most closely marries the healthcare industry. Okay. Did you know that? It, it's similar, right? It's very similar. So how is it similar? You have high cholesterol. You go to a doctor. What does the doctor do? Prescribe you some medicine. That's right. And your cholesterol goes down. Now, what happens if you stop taking the pill? It, I'm back to the doctor. Right? And this process is treating symptoms. The healthcare industry treats mm -hmm. symptoms because that's where all the money is, right? In that infinity loop of back and forth through that, you're only ever treating the symptom. The doctor doesn't sit down and say, what are you eating? How are you eating? What type of exercise do you do? Most doctors don't involve themselves in most of that stuff, right? Because if you started fundamentally trying to help someone change behaviorally, now you're treating the causes, right? And if you help someone fix the cause, do they need to keep coming back to you? Yeah. So the idea here is when you look at coaching, much of coaching, and again, there's nothing wrong with this function per se, it's just that much of coaching is built currently around treating symptoms. Right? Business is slow, anxiety comes up in an agent, because remember, it's a comparison industry. Everything that you do in real estate is comparison mm -hmm. thinking. And in that, you feel this pressure, so you go to a coach, it's great, there's accountability, they give you things to do, the scripts, make these phone calls, here's what you say, here's what you do, and you do that stuff. And guess what? Business goes up, but what happens when you stop coaching? Yeah. Right? Because we didn't address the original behavior of why are you not doing it? What's the fear that comes up? What's happening in your life, right? Why is time management difficult? We're not addressing any of that. So therefore, you're back in that infinity loop of having to go to someone to help them build that back up to then all of a sudden, right? The best in engagement, I think, with people is to simplify that process down to helping them from a behavioral aspect understand what's the smallest, simplest thing that I can do that produces the highest return on my investment, both personally and professionally, and then allow them to get really good at just that. We're always trying to change people. Do more of this, do less of this, do more of that, do less of that. The reality of it is, is you're fine the way you are. You're absolutely fine as is. Guess what? We just need to sand the edges a little bit, right? Tweak this one <laughs> little piece and help you cut that noise down. Mm -hmm. And the answer isn't make 200 more phone calls to people. Think about it. Agents operate from a place of overwhelm, anxious, stressed, right? All the emotions are pulling in from all their clients, all these different people, all the things that are constantly changing, their engagement, their personal life, their family life, all these things are swirling. They're already operating in a frenetic state. And when you're anxious and you go to someone, should they be telling you, here's 20 more things you should be doing right now? Right. The, yeah. the logic doesn't necessarily always line up with those so things. So they should probably direct you and, and find uh, what's the best in you, about you, and use it to grow and uh, and use all your positive qualities. I'm just thinking about myself and being focused. That sure. was my problem. Um, and instead of probably going twice a month to a coach, please remind me what should I do to be focused is to focus on myself, concentrate, find what's so great about myself and how I can improve my, uh, my direction of being focused and not spread myself thin. Right. Well, and the first thing to do is to understand what's all the stuff you're doing and do you even need to be doing all that stuff, right? Yeah. It's, is all of that necessary? What's the actual return on all that stuff? Is it really producing anything? And then you want to begin to understand 
what is it that's coming up when you start thinking about certain things? What is the fear? What's the anxiety? What are the stresses? What are those things? Because remember, you know, in, in, the amazing part of the real estate business itself is that it is highly dysfunctional from top to bottom. Really think about it. A transaction has like six different people in three different industries involved in it already. Exactly, yeah. Each one of those different industries, their job is to keep their portion as complicated as possible because that's what keeps them doing what they're doing. And then you've got all these disruptors around that are talking about we're going to simplify things and we're going to make this easier and we're going to eliminate the agent and blah, 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 and all this other stuff, right? When the truth of the matter is, as you said, go back to relationships. At the end of the day, what does the average consumer need? The consumer needs a Sherpa. They need a guide. They don't need someone climbing the mountain for them. They don't need uh, someone to say, hey, I've got all the information. Only I have this special information because that's not true anymore. Everybody has the information. Mm -hmm. Some of it might be wrong, but they need a Sherpa. They need the guide up the mountain that says, you don't really want to go make a right there or time to get your jacket because there's a storm coming. Mm -hmm. That's the role and the new function of what an agent needs to do. That is highly relationship driven and that's built predominantly around trust. But we're already in a process, right, of thinking about how do we begin to focus on trust? And it's like my favorite saying in real estate, and I mean this facetiously, is I'm a trusted advisor. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. If I need to tell you, it's okay. You can trust me. Guess what? There's a problem there, <laughs> right? If you went in to purchase something and it was a very large pur purchase and someone mm -hmm. said to you, like, hey, so nice to meet you. Guess what? You can trust me. <laughs> I'm your trusted advisor. Here. You'd be like, okay, thanks for playing. I'm out of here. I'm not going to do this anymore. You right? know, we have this uh, Russian uh, radio station here in New York. It's out of Brooklyn. And there are uh, several, actually, attorneys. And they always start with, you can trust me. Yeah. I'm a trusted I'm a tr attorney. Yeah, and right? And then the first thing, like, there is no way I will ever call <laughs> exactly. your number. <laughs> exactly, right? It's all about experience. And, and it's amazing because, again, it, it is this idea that we need to convince people of something. And I, listen, I could talk all day about the psychology behind where that comes from and why it happens. But the truth of the matter is, you know, relationships are built on trust. That's not new, right? That's, a, right. that's, an, old, that's an old school thing. But we're not focused on where does that trust come from, right? In real estate, we come from this defensive position where I have to convince you that I'm worthy of something rather than me putting the best of who I am forward and then allowing you to make the decision if the best of who I am fits and aligns with your needs. That's the whole shooting match. And if you say no, that's not a reflection on me being a bad person or I didn't do this or I failed at a listing presentation. or That's a false narrative that goes through almost everybody's head. The truth of the matter is if I put the best of who I am forward for somebody and I leave it all on the table, and I'm passionate about knowing that's really what I love doing, what I'm great at. Mm -hmm. And it's not right for you. Guess what? Awesome. I get to move on because is that going to be a healthy relationship if I transform who I am to fit your needs? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When's the last time you ever went on a date with someone? Well, you've been married a long time, so <laughs> bad example. But when was the last time anybody went on a date with someone and was like, hi, I know we just met. What do you need me to be? Because I'm going to change everything about myself <laughs> to fit what you need. Like, that doesn't work, right? It doesn't work at Yet, all. Yet, what do we do? It's the first thing we present to people. What do you need? What can I, you want to sell your house for a ridiculous amount of money that's not real? Okay, let's do that together. Like, it's just, you know. So that kind of ties me into referral business because that is, uh, if someone refers, and even if I don't know that agent from Adam, but I trust my friend who is saying, you know what? He is the best thing ever happened to real estate. You got to hire him. That is an advice if I trust my friend and not that I will always do that, mm -hmm. but that is a uh, referral business is growing. Some agents have up to 95% of their referral business and that's all they live off. They live off their referrals because they were, all, uh, they were able to build that foundation and spread the word about themselves through their friends, through their clients. So how would you support the referral business? How would I support the support referral it. business? Like how would you put, how would you advise your agents to build strong referral business? Though I don't know the answer to it, so I hope you do. I don't really know the answer to it in terms of the way that traditional real estate thinks about it, which is, again, go back to that, what are the things that we should be doing to show, right? It's, you know, 32 touches or whatever. I mean, think about this. If you think about, I have to remind you, I'm in real estate, I'm in real estate, I'm in real estate, I'm in real estate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If I came to your house, 32 times a year and I rang your doorbell and you opened the door and I was like, hey, I'm an agent. <laughs> just want to remind you and left. How long before you got a restraining order on me? 
<laughs> Probably yeah. after two. <laughs> right, right. By three, you'd have a shotgun. But the idea is like at this point in time, what do we do? I'm in real estate. I'm in real estate. It's like that's not referral building because you said one key thing before. Those people that you worked with or you engaged with or know you, right, even if you didn't perform a transaction with them, referred you to somebody else. But that only happens based on trust. Nothing that we are doing is engaging with people with who they are, where they're coming from, what they love, where their passions, what is important to them. We're always trying to convince somebody else of something, of our worthiness. And this is, it's got to stop. It's got to stop because this is where all the problems come in from. This is where it all lies. It's more about getting a referral from somebody of a vote of confidence, right? It's more about getting someone to say, I trust this person to tell somebody else that I trust this person. Mm -hmm. That's what they're saying. And so how do you establish and maintain that trust? Rehumanize that relationship with somebody. Ask them what's happening in their life. Engage with them on things that are important to them. You know they love gardening and you know they have spectacular gardens. What happens if you call them up and say, hey, I was thinking about getting into gardening. I know nothing about gardening and remember how amazing your gardens were. Book, a couple things I might buy, like what do you think? No one thinks of doing that, why? because we think we have to be the experts in something. We have to convince somebody, right? The more you humanize yourself, the more that we open up a little bit, the more that we stop this idea that I have this, I'm in, you know, I'm in this sales position where I have to convince you of something and that can I, maybe I don't, that you open up to people like that and you engage them involving and being a person in their life, you don't need to worry about the rest of it. There's no app, there's no, there's no auto drip campaign. There's no, you don't need to worry about that stuff. It's, it's the, the shooting match is actually relatively simple. It's not very complex. I love what you say. <laughs> I can actually relate to everything you are saying right now. I um, would like to switch to something completely different. Um, Miniature golf. <laughs> no? Okay. We're still talking real estate, right? Uh, just in case. I thought still, we were going to go way out of line there, here. Yeah. Still there. Um, MLS right now is. Uh, struggling in a way uh, with Zillow and uh, with CoStar, your traditional real estate company, your brokerage that has traditional values. And it's it's all kind of like confusing right now. And the agents are lost and they don't even understand what their broke, traditional brokerage will look like in another few years. They don't understand how Zillow and CoStar will affect their business and their commission structure and everything else. Can we talk about that? Sure. It's going to be, it might be a short answer I give you on some of these things, but what, particularly in and around that, what would you like to know? Well, how, well let's start with traditional brokerage. Okay. What do you expect in another year or so? Will it be more mergers, acquisitions? Will agents be more independent trying to work for smaller brokerage with higher commission splits? Will they have... Um, Will, will they be willing to have splits as 25, 75, but the brokerage takes care of them from A to Z? How, how do you, what's, what's your opinion on that? I know you don't have a crystal ball, but I, what's your opinion? I don't, I don't have that crystal ball, and, and you just said my opinion on it. So I, I will tell you as, as someone, anybody watching this right now can, can attest, my opinion's worth what you pay for it, nothing. <laughs> so I, I will preface this by telling you, um, I don't really worry about CoStar, Zillow, all those things that disrupt them. Like all, that stuff doesn't, that's not the thing that I worry about um, when it comes to agents, their success, their growth within the industry. Um, I do worry about lawsuits. Um, I, the DOJ suing NAR right now is a major problem that I don't think enough people are paying attention to. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that there's three separate class action lawsuits across the country happening with, again, NAR and other major brokerages that are problems that, that agents need to be paying attention to. Zillow, CoStar, those folks will be reactive and they will react and pivot to whatever's happening in that other landscape. But the truth of the matter is right now, real estate is like 10 to 15 years behind and it has always been current things that are happening. And it's a very slow moving ship. And I do think that the true disruption that's going to happen is going to come from those lawsuits. Because when you change buyer agency, when you change um, whether sellers are paying out commission for buyers, when you change um, certain aspects of, of how the MLS operates and whether listings can be private exclusives or coming soons or all the different things that, mm -hmm. that happen with that, when you have national sweeping change at that level, 
that is a huge shift in how agents are going to operate. And that is the quickest, fastest turn that's going to happen. So I look at it as what can agents be doing now that no matter what happens over there down the road, the impact is not really that great. Mm -hmm. Right. What are those things? And I hate to go back to like relationships again, but the reality of it is, is an agent that has a strong network of people that they support continuously engage with mm -hmm. and that they really have built strong, healthy relationships with, whether the model changes, whether the brokerage function changes, whether agents become employees or like whatever crazy thing is, you know, is, is coming down the pipe and possibly it still goes back to that same fundamental functional process, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter the structure and the path. It only matters in how you're going to walk it because you've set yourself up in a way that insulates you from all the noise that goes on around that. So I don't know what's going to happen down the road, but I do feel that there's a window of opportunity right now that if agents aren't really getting serious about how they root themselves more mm -hmm. in insulating themselves in, in the connections that they have, it's gonna create a bigger problem because the more fractured something becomes, mm -hmm. the harder it is to hold on to people's attention. You know, we live in a very, very uh, instant gratification world, right? And social right. media and all these different pieces and parts of stuff. So I think that trust, again, you know, is gonna be a, a key component in how we move forward through a lot of this stuff. And you mentioned real estate industry is at least 15 years behind. I'm sure that it's our fault that we are our industry, that we are so much involved in as full-time living through every day, um, why are we 15 years behind? Well, because it was built that way, right? I mean, think about it. The real estate industry itself on the whole, in a transaction, there's like five, six different people involved in that transaction. The brokerage, the agent, the, uh, it, the inspector, the mortgage, the title. There's like all these different people. The lawyer. Each, the lawyer, right? <laughs> all those people want to keep their piece of it really complicated, right? Because if you simplified it and made it really easy, guess what you don't need anymore? Them. So if you keep every one of those components relatively complicated and then you add in state regulation and of course the town needs to get there and a little cut from that and then you've got federal regulation, it's an incredibly complex process. And the, the kind of, the interesting part to me is when you look at all those difficult levels of complexity, it should be even more so that an agent is like, wow, do you need me now more than ever? Because with every passing change that comes, whether it be from lawsuits or whether it be from you know, changes in, in how people are engaging with technology, all the more reason that an agent should say, I am that Sherpa. I'm the person that's gonna help you navigate through these different processes, right? And you know, I don't know that, that we are always so adept to recognizing or feeling like, what our role is can be less than what we think we have to make it. There's an element of the, the intensity mm -hmm. that I see sometimes around agents of, I have to convince, right? I, I have to demonstrate that you absolutely need me. Sometimes you just don't, mm -hmm. right? I, I look back at, if you think of most of the relationships that we have in our life and the people mm -hmm. that we've stayed friends with or mm -hmm. that we've stayed connected with the longest, Many times I think that comes from our, again, our ability to open up and humanize ourselves to those people. That's what makes that last the longest. And so that fear of change, and you know, we've talked about change, you mm -hmm. and I in the past, that fear of change is, it's very limiting. It's very, very limiting because it stops someone from being able to be reflective, self-reflective and look and say, what is my function and role in this? And do I need to consistently feel like I have to add more into that than really needs to be there? Because all this other stuff is just gonna, come and go, but you know, most people are, are, most people at their fundamental nature want to be heard, understood, appreciated, loved. It's a basic very function, simple, very yeah. simple thing, right? And we <laughs> add all these levels of complexity into it. Well, let's make uh, another very complex statement here. Uh, new direction with uh, blockchain, with cryptocurrency, uh, NFT platform, and, and uh, it, it looks like it's inevitable. It looks like it's going to be here. It's already here, 12%, according to some studies, 12% uh, of first-time buyers last year used some kind of cryptocurrency in their down payment. So what is happening with agents who do not like change? We already established that, mm -hmm. uh, not adapting well, totally different technology. Uh, what's your take on it? 
Wow, that's a big question, right? <laughs> um, think about what it is that you're asking someone to embrace. And this is not just real estate agents. Crypto, blockchain, NFT is already a very difficult thing for somebody to understand because it's not tangible and real, right? right. It's not a physical thing I can touch and feel. It's not something that I can go to the NFT store on the corner and go check out some NFTs. It's not an actual thing. So you already have one an agent who is feeling overwhelmed by trying to maintain all the different parts and moving pieces of a transaction plus growing their business. Two, then you've got on top of that, the, the idea that like that type of uh, awareness to learn way ahead of what's happening is very hard for a lot of people. And three, you're talking about something that lives in the clouds somewhere. It's not a real thing. If you remember when cloud technology came out, how mm -hmm. hard it was for people to understand the concept of cloud technology. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, no, it lives on a server somewhere, someplace else, but you're sort of remote viewing that con <laughs> like, No, but my phone's here. Yeah, right? Amazon like, goes down and then... <laughs> yeah, right? And then all of a sudden we're like, and then we don't trust that, right? So, you know, it, anybody, forget just real estate, it's hard to emotionally, you know, open up to that idea. You know, I, I view real estate's position as one in which it would be incredibly, incredibly useful, helpful, important, you know, I look at, you know, folks like my nephew who is in finance, um, but also has a deep understanding. Uh, one of my good friends, V Band, has a deep understanding of these things. And when these folks say to me, these are things you should be paying attention to because they're going to dramatically shift and change how people engage in the industry, particularly I think when municipalities begin to have certain things where their computers and their technology catches up a little bit, when you're processing deeds and stuff like that, or when you need to get, um, you know, as part of the transaction, if you think about even in a more interesting way, think about like title. But yeah, but there are titles now that we are working with cryptocurrency. Yes, but think about what has to be involved for all of these local municipalities across the country to update their infrastructures and technology. So this is a process, but I, I think that agents will do well by learning the foundation first. And when it feels overwhelming, take a step back and remember, guess what? I only need to understand one small piece at a time, mm -hmm. right? I don't need to go into all of a sudden trying to figure out how does all of this work and what if my client want levels, small pieces to begin to work your way into it, but avoiding it and sort of being, ah, oh, it's things for the kids. Like that's not going to help either. Well, in Miami, for example, right now there are courses available. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you get certified, but it is certified uh, as far as property.com. Uh, for you to understand so you can at least explain to your buyers or sellers who are interested that you make sense. So I think there is a class that is available. So in some MLSs, sure. um, and I guess it's the first step forward for MLS to participate in education. The average agent has on average 4,000 contacts in their CRM on average. What percentage of those contacts have an address attached to them? Yeah, that's, you see, like, I would think it's 75, but you probably think that it's less. 12 to 15%. 4,000 contacts, 12 to 15% on average have an address attached to the contact card. And what do we do for a living? We sell homes. We buy, right, with people <laughs> in that process. Just think about that for a minute. <laughs> and you want me to start talking about NFT crypto engagement with classes being 12 to 15 years <laughs> behind what's happening, right? So... I'm not trying to say it can't be done. I'm simply saying you eat an elephant one bite at a time. Like it's just starting to begin to scratch the surface of understanding at a fundamental level. What is it? Because that takes some time. I sat down, I went through it. I mean, one of my good friends teaches it. I was lost in the first 10 minutes of the conversation, like literally lost. I was like, I don't know what you're talking about here anymore. I, do I buy a vow? Is Vanna White here? Like what is going on? Like, I don't even know what's happening. So. It really does have to be a slow incremental thing. The problem is though, if you ignore it for too long, technology continues to change. One of my favorite uh, things came from George Carlin where he said that the only problem with technology is that you need technology to understand technology. Mm -hmm. And that's a little bit of what I think about happens in these things is that people already come from a place of fear so they don't really wanna lean into that stuff. There's so many other things that require more of our attention that we don't carve out the opportunity to learn just a small piece of something because we think we have to understand all of it. So I just like to bring that into a more simplified process. Well, that that is a very uh, right answer, I guess. And But 
the most what I uh, took from your, uh, for your, from your reply is that agents should be prepared, so they should pay attention, even if they're not ready to take a class, if they're not ready to spend an hour with, a, with someone who understands crypto or any other technology. Sure. They should really approach and think about it, because if you analyze what happened to us in the last 25 years, like with internet and mm -hmm. websites, and no one really believed in it. I was the first one who didn't believe in internet, and mm -hmm. look at it now. You so depend on internet, you cannot live a minute without it. So I think crypto will crypto us, and we will have to uh, pay attention. Yeah, absolutely. Um, coming back to um, what's comfortable for you, and technology is not comfortable for a lot of people, but what is comfortable, and we were talking about it like, for example, with postcards. I don't feel comfortable sending hundreds and hundreds of postcards. Uh, but I am comfortable calling people, stopping by, shaking hands, giving hugs. I'm a hugger. Um, what's your approach about that? Well, first of all, I just want to go backwards for one second into that. Why are you not comfortable sending postcards? It's just not me. I just feel it's a little cheesy, though. Nothing wrong with that. Trust okay. me, I love receiving postcards. Sure. I enjoy that. Okay, but that's not who you are fundamentally. No. Okay. And somewhere, somewhere, someone along the line, I'm sure, told you that you should be sending postcards. Yes. Right. How did it make you feel when you didn't do it? But like I'm not accomplishing something. I'm missing something. Something's wrong with me. So you've already suppressed who you are, what brings you joy, and what makes you happy. And on top of that, you added in there, I'm going to feel crappy about myself because I'm not accomplishing something that somebody told me I should be doing this because all the cool kids are doing this, and this is the way that you're going to win, right? Yet, what is it you enjoy doing? Stopping by and hugging people, shaking hands. Human talking. connection. That's what you do well. That's who you are fundamentally, right? So here's the whole shooting match. You ready? Why is that wrong? It's probably not wrong, but uh, I'm just trying to figure out what would be right if I were to do that. What would be right if you were to do what? To like send postcards and um, and listen to someone else's advice that I should maybe change a little bit of my direction and maybe accomplish more. <laughs> You've been in this business for a lot of years. <laughs> How many people refer you and use you because of your human engagement with them? When you show up, you talk to them, you give hugs, you engage with them. How many people have you gotten referrals from over the years because of that? 99%. How many people read your newsletter or your update, or your company, whatever, and was like, I got to work with you. 20%. And yet you're feeling badly about the idea that that's not enough. This is the problem. It doesn't matter really what industry and business you're in per se. Think about it even more so in real estate. Yes, it's even bigger. But the fundamental problem is, is that someone along the line told you what you were doing and who you are is not enough. It's not okay to take the parts of you that are good and lean into that and really embrace that you're constantly having to change who you are because postcards are the way, 200 phone calls are the way, all these things that work against the grain of who you naturally are. That, why? Doesn't really make sense if you think about it, but yet we're constantly in this place of trying to figure out how do I change myself fundamentally to accommodate what other people believe I should be. It's an industry full of folks trying to compete with each other when the reality of it is, is who are they competing with? Mm -hmm. Themselves all day long. Well, well, thank you. Thank you, Lance. And I'm so happy that you agreed to, uh, to meet with me and do that interview. I'm learning so much, and I really, really appreciate your, uh, your point of view and your opinion uh, and everything you have to say. Thank uh, you. You're more than welcome. I, I will leave you with this, that I, I think that one of the key components that we need to work on collectively and mm -hmm. how we help agents get better at what they do, agents operate right in the center of two circles if you overlap them, right? There's a like a Venn diagram. Mm -hmm. One is a pervasive thought that agents have of I'm not enough. And the other one is a pervasive thought of I'm not doing enough. And if you overlap those two things right in the center, that's where an agent lives. The reality of it is, is that type of thinking of I'm not enough and I'm not doing enough is what's driving this mechanism that we believe is what's creating success for us. And I am constantly challenging that belief system because the truth of the matter is, is that people are successful in spite of that narrative that plays in their head. So the more that we can help agents recognize who you are is enough, what you're doing is enough, and it's all okay. In fact, a lot of what you need to be doing is what? A hell of a lot less. That's where you find better comfort. Agents want community. They want to feel connected to other people and like-minded thinking. They want to feel like what they do 
provides value and service because most of us got into this business because we wanted to help people. Nobody got up in the morning and was like, I want to do Google Docs and Sheets and fill out contracts all day. It's like not a thing, right? <laughs> Yet all of the things that were taught and trained tell us what? Change who you are, change how you operate, send more things, be less human. Like that relentless pursuit in this industry has got to stop because it's not actually what's driving better connections, better engagement, and driving trust with people, which is what's going to keep the industry healthy, vibrant, and have people mostly connected into how they grow, but also become profitable and build businesses that are really sustainable around those opportunities. Technology is a huge advantage to manage the backs of things, right? That you really don't need to be focusing on. Leverage and learn those things, help that be a part of it to free you up to go focus on being amazing as is. I talk a lot about as is. You're totally fine as is. And enjoy yourself. Hell Have yeah, fun right? every morning. Get up in the morning and enjoy. That's and right. Enjoy being who you are and enjoy working with the uh, with, with your clients who are, who can become your friends. You got it. And it's been, by the way, it is so nice to see you again because after all these years, think about it. Why did I agree to even do this interview with you? Thank you. Because I love who you are, right? And we've had a fantastic relationship over the past couple of years of different industry things and we popped in and out of each other's lives, but this has been a lot of fun and I'm really grateful to see you again. Thank you, Lance. Thank you so much. No problem. Cheers.